Dream Theory. The theory I respectfully dislike with a passion. But I have to admit it's the only theory that seems to properly explain FNAF 1 through 4 before it was retconned. At the time, that is. You see, there's a new theory I thought about that with the help of my friends became much more clear. What if I told you FNAF 1 through 4, the Silver Eyes, and FNAF World all connected seamlessly without plot holes and inconsistencies? What if I told you that we knew the retcon Scott was referring to? What if I told you we solved Five Nights at Freddy's? I'd like to make clear that this theory is split up into two parts. It's important that you know what each part entails, as they're both important to view in order to understand the full context, confidence, and evidence supporting this theory. Part 1 is focused on the games and the explanation of them, so don't worry, you'll get the full story alone in this video. Part 2 is focused on addressing all the supporting connections found in FNAF World and FNAF The Silver Eyes, as well as what we theorize is the retcon Scott was referring to in his Reddit post. It'll also include some tips Zipper and I have when it comes to analyzing the evidence FNAF presents. Being covered by my great friend Zipperbot, he's also the guy who made the super snazzy thumbnail by the way. Unfortunately, part 2 will have to come out at a later date due to more time being needed to put it together. I'm also aware of just how long this video is, but trust me, if you really want to understand something that aims to explain everything before, and what was the retcon, then it's important to watch through everything, and not just skim through it or speed it up to try to cheat the system. You're going to have to take your time with this kind of thing. The most important thing of all to keep in mind though, this is just a theory. Meaning that if you have a different perspective of what the original story was, then that's okay. Just because I claim to have solved FNAF, it doesn't mean I actually did. I actually meant it more as an exaggeration in order to draw your attention. Um, secret YouTuber trick there. I think we can collectively agree that no one will truly solve FNAF unless Scott comes out and says something. Hi guys! Before we get into part 1, there are a few things I want to make clear as well. It's important that we go over these in order to understand FNAF and the process that went into solving the original intent. I believe we should recap on what exactly Dream Theory is in terms of solving FNAF 1-4, through specifically Ultimate Dream Theory, in order to compare and contrast what was commonly agreed as the only way to solve FNAF and the solution I present today. I recommend this video specifically by Cyrus Squawks, as it connects much more compared to MadPat's original Dream Theory video. Link in the description below. I suggest pausing here and going to watch that video before returning to continue this video. Alright, let's start with the obvious. The infamous livestream where Scott gave three clues to guide theorists in the right direction. These clues are meant to be solved using only FNAF 1-4. through We know this because just three days before this livestream, Scott confirmed in a Steam post that the story was complete and the new game, FNAF World, would not be canon despite obviously tying into the lore later on. The book, The Silver Eyes, would also not be released for some time. So this means we need to solve FNAF only using evidence from these first four games alone, along with this evidence being used to solve these clues specifically. However, another important part of these clues is to understand the context in which Scott had shown them, and how they responded to what was said in the livestream where they were covered. Thanks to FNAFLore.com and the Freddy Facts blog Tumblr page, we're able to view and interpret that context. Seriously, huge thanks to both of these pages. Links in the description below to check them out. If we follow the stream, we'll see that the order of the clues are as follows. In the FNAF 4 minigame, why would the tiny toy chica be missing her beak? Seen on stream at 1 hour 15 minutes and 55 seconds. What is seen in shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child. Seen on stream at 1 hour 21 minutes and 52 seconds. Lastly, 4 games, 1 story. Seen on stream at 1 hour 26 minutes and 22 seconds. So in order to understand what these clues were a response to, we need to rewind the stream to see what MatPat and the others were discussing. As a result, we can speculate that the clues are in response to the comments as follows. In the FNAF 4 minigame, why would the tiny toy chica be missing her beak is a response to the discussion of red herrings and easter eggs in the games. 
At 1 hour 6 minutes and 22 seconds, MatPat addresses Scott's statement of, there are no random easter eggs, and he brings up how he thinks that Scott is contradicting himself by stating how he believes that Scott changed the date from 87 to 83 based on how he viewed the source code hints in the teasers. I, I, would, agree, I would agree, so it's interesting, right? Um, and and you, it's also hard to tell, Scott, now we, since we know you're listening, we, it's also really hard to tell what is and isn't an easter egg or clue, right? So as, as uh, I believe it was Skyhawk Gaming, I, I, we were citing earlier from Twitter, says, and how, as you yourself have said, there are no random easter eggs. And yet, in the source code leading up to the release of FNAF 4, 87 was everywhere. All of the, all of the art and stuff was like hinting at 87 being a key date, you know. But, I, but Scott, seriously though, you know, like, you say that there are no random Easter eggs, but then you release a game that supposedly takes place in 1983. As as we conclude, as you yourself kind I'm of go ahead and just say that it definitely does. And yeah, I think I think we all agree at this point that FNAF 4 takes place in 1983. Yet all of the pre promo teaser imagery materials hints were hinting at 87 and bite of 87. But think, but I... MatPat believes that the 87 was implying that we would see the bite of 87 in this game. 87? They also bring up the photos of Scott and his family to support this point, as how would that not be a random Easter egg in reference to everything else in the game? Yeah, you know, like that. I think that's not like I, I wouldn't categorize it the same way as like he's not going to put like a picture of him and his family like <laughs> like that's 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 like yeah. So is this how Scott and his family poses? Well, I'm just saying like this is like a fun like, Mister and Mrs. Coffin right here. That 87 business mm -hmm. to me that's like him like. Setting you up for a roast. Like, yep. Like that. I, I Set, he's setting you up so he can knock you down. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying he's trying to like get you. I'm yeah, just of course. Like, it's it's like a, it was a red herring, I think, mm -hmm. to prep people for believing that that was going to be the bite of '87. Yep. As a as sort of like a as, tactic to obscure the fact that actually it was actually this other event that other happened event. earlier in the franchise's yeah. history. And he want and and by doing that he made us think about it in that way. Okay. Uh, but but like. Like I'm saying, like if there's no Easter eggs in the game, right? Mm -hmm. The picture of his fam, him and his family in the hallway, if that's actually what it is. Yeah. If those, if those pictures in the game are actually of him. Yeah. Uh, as it seems, maybe is the case. Yes. Uh, I forget who's saying. Yeah, a little something in the mirror. There you go. There you go, honey. I think, <laughs> I think Daco, I think Daco, was onto something there mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, if, if it's a picture of him, mm -hmm. and it's his voice as the phone guy, like. That that's the type of stuff that like, if you're trying to solve the game, mm -hmm. there's no information in the game that's not intentional. Mm -hmm. That's the type, that's the type of stuff that you really need to be looking out for. Yeah. <laughs> However, they also bring up how purple guys holding the phone, and well, there being a purple phone in FNAF 4. Random theory. Child from FNAF 4, same-sex couple, phone guy and purple guy are both his parents. Yeah, they're both his dads. Maybe that's why he's purple guy. Maybe, as a, maybe that, that, or maybe purple guy and pink, I don't know, we're, we're throwing, you know what, we're throwing out stuff, because why not? Okay. Because there is evidence for both. Anyway. Everybody said he's holding a phone, there's a purple phone in the dang house. There is the purple phone in the, in the house. There's a purple phone. Right, so house. now you're just mixing it, you're mixing it up, but right? But like those, that, that's the kind of stuff that you got to really think about. Like It is. Yeah, this did not age well. What is seen in shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child. It is also likely a response to this discussion as well, although I will admit it's not as direct as the other two. Lastly, four games, one story, is a response to the discussion of FNAF 2 never existing. At 1 hour, 24 minutes, and 10 seconds, MatPat brings up an idea, one that he himself addresses as, Again, this is completely off the wall. He goes on to ask, Was it possible that FNAF 2 didn't actually happen? Going on to suggest that, it might be possible that FNAF 2 is similar to how I viewed FNAF 4, taking place in the mind of a child. Is it possible that FNAF 2 didn't actually happen? And it was just, um, yeah, I know what you mean. Like, is it possible? Yeah, no, is it possible that FNAF 2, like, the, the main game of FNAF 2, like, putting on the mask, the, the animatronics, like, sliding across the screen, jumping out, all that <laughs> stuff, is it possible that that... All, similar to FNAF 4, which takes place inside the mind of a child, you know, is it possible that FNAF 2 also took place in the mind of a child? You know, maybe again, this tortured boy who sees Chica without her beak, who sees the toy animatronics, who sees Mangle in pieces in a separate room in his home, um, 
Is that a possible? I don't like again. This is me theorizing out of the blue, just toss. But my mom, it, when I hear or when I see Chica without her beak, and I hear Scott saying, you know, what exists in the mind of chat, what you see in the shadows, what, what ah. you know could be like. Is this is FNAF two just this hypothetical situation that this child has like conceived? And I, and I hate going to the like. Because one of the things that we strive for on Game Theorists is when we create theories, not resorting to like, it's a coma, it's a second dimension. You know, I mean, sometimes it's warranted. Like our Pokemon theory about the second, you know, the multiverse, that was very warranted. Here, but, you know, and he, and here in FNAF 4, I think it's also warranted. The dream. Maybe they're unrelated though. Maybe because that's a huge pill to swallow. It is a huge pill. And that's it completely like, upends. It breaks like, like the kid would have to have knowledge of things that like, no child, like, why would he know even about like how paychecks work? But, but, but I mean, uh, sure, maybe. But again, also think about the the aspect element of putting on a mask. Oh. You know, you have a child maybe putting on a mask, or you have the brother who uh. has shown himself to regularly put on a mask. Uh -huh. You know, again, I. He essentially plants the seeds for what would eventually become dream theory at a later point. As if a direct response to this theory, Scott Games is updated with the final clue. This is, without having any time to, to really think through this stuff, my mind immediately jumps to their... D D Daco is... I'm sorry. I love Daco's revelations. He's like... Okay. It's big. It's a big one. What? What? What is it? Um, he said... Oh, this is still from Scott? Is this email? Uh, no, apparently it's from the website. All right. It, uh, it said four games, one story. I'm getting. It's all the. So, hold on. Yeah, he said four games, one story. That's what he said on the website. Four games, one story. I mean, we were assuming that it was kind of one story. I mean. <laughs> it would seem in this context, Sky is trying to make clear that all games are connected and necessary to figure out the full story. To summarize. If there are no random easter eggs in FNAF 4, why is 87 brought up during the teasing of the game and why are there pictures of Scott's family in the FNAF 4 house? To which Scott answers indirectly with, in the FNAF 4 minigame, why is the tiny Torchica missing her beak? Secondly, the clue, what is seen in shadows is misunderstood in the mind of a child, is not a direct response to anything said after the previous clue was given, instead of being a follow up to the discussion of red herrings and easter eggs. What if FNAF 2 never existed? To which Scott answers with four games with story, implying that regardless if they were a dream or not, each game is important to look at in order to understand the complete story. Now I know this one is going to be a hot topic, but let me explain. The Silver Eyes was originally released before Sister Location, even being released before FNAF World. Because of this, we can assume that the original direction of the novel, or novels, was similar to the original story of FNAF for the retcon. This would explain a noticeable difference with its two sequels that would be the result of a deal made after the retcon. However, just as people are realizing how important these books are now, this one book was just as important back when it was released. Scott's response to the confusion on how the book has seemingly nothing to do with the games was to not go into the book trying to solve the games using the book as it was a reimagining of the previously complete story. However, Scott did state that despite the book and the story being separate continuities, they do share many familiar elements going on to confirm that the book is canon, like the games, but that they're not intended to fit together and slash or solve each other directly. Instead, this book is meant to share familiar themes, concepts, and characters from the games in an alternate universe. These similarities can then be used to understand the game's intended story better, while not directly solving it at the same time. Sound familiar? The same could be said with FNAF World. Despite FNAF World never originally intending to be part of the lore, it would go on to have this unexplained connection with the series that lived on even after the retcon. One that is often overlooked due to the common fan assumption that it was never canon, despite clear indication of some connection. However, the connection, much like the Silver Eyes, is used to strengthen the complete story of FNAF 1 through 4 rather than add a new chapter of lore. FNAF World and the Silver Eyes novel are not necessary to figure out the story present in the FNAF 1 through 4 games. They exist to help us confirm it. Now that we're caught up with the surrounding context and mindset that went into this theory, we're ready to begin. The show will begin momentarily. 
Everyone, please stay in your seats. This is Forgotten Theory. 1982, Fredericks Family Diner opens. We can assume it was 1982 specifically because Scott deliberately hid this date in the source code when he was teasing FNAF 4. One of these teasers in particular is theorized to have the name Fredbear's Family Diner in it. Scott didn't change his mind about the date the bite took place. He knew what 87, 83, and 82 represented. 82 is when Fred Bears opened, 83 is the bite slash missing children's incident, and 87 is the save them incident slash bite of 87. 1983. After the success of Fred Bears, a sister location is open titled Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. A young girl is kidnapped outside of Freddy's and killed. The killer is the co-owner of Fred Bears, and the friend of the father of the girl. We know the killer has a higher connection with the establishment due to brandishing a security badge and being aware of the safe rooms. This would explain why the girl would trust them. This girl would go on to become the puppet and is the first victim of the missing children's incident. We can connect her to the MCI as she not only dies the same year, but dies at Freddy's and not Fred Bears. We can determine the establishment we see in Take Cake as Freddy's and not Fred Bears thanks to the visual design of the bear along with Save Them being a parallel to this minigame. We can theorize Save Them as a parallel to Take Cake primarily thanks to this minigame originally being triggered by being killed by the puppet. The scenario in Save Them is rather similar to Take Cake, featuring Withered Freddy being directed to save the children in harm's way of the purple guy, only this time, the puppet is there to guide the spirit instead of Freddy, although just like before, you can't. Five more children being killed is another parallel, signifying the Take Cake minigame was a part of the MCI rather than being disconnected. It's also worth noting that this is the only minigame not to feature a jump scare at the end. I theorize this is because it was meant to be shown which animatronic was connected to this minigame by how the minigame was originally triggered by the puppet. The siblings of the girl, a young boy and his older brother Mike, are in grief. We know this girl is a sister due to her being the twin of the bite victim, explaining why their rooms both contain a color swap bed against the wall on the right with a color swap dresser with a light on the left supporting piece of evidence that isn't needed but confirms this belief is found in the Silver Eyes novel, detailing how Sammy and Charlie are twins. Mike takes it harder than the bite victim, choosing to take out his frustration on his brother. He's gonna be hiding somewhere. I can hear him laughing. He's gonna be in my room. No he's not. Oh Jesus Christ for God's sake! In context of this theory, what the crying child would have seen was the killer putting the springlock suit on someone based on the easter egg we see in the Night 2 minigame. This is answered by the clue, what is seen in shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child. We know the scene of the killer putting the man in the suit is in the shadows because the killer is shown as purple here, and Scott confirmed the reason the killer is purple is because he's in the shadows. From this, we can assume that the bite victim is afraid of the suits and not the characters, since he considers his plushies his friends. I also believe four of the kids shown in FNAF 4 are part of the MCI due to connections between them and the minigames in FNAF 3. Balloon Kid is Freddy, his balloon sharing a similar color to BB. Saving the child in BB's air adventure results in Freddy appearing in Happiest Day. The toy Chica girl is Chica, for obvious reasons. Saving the child in Chica's party results in Chica appearing in Happiest Day. The girl with the pigtails is Foxy. This is because she refers to being hidden in the back of Freddy's, which is where the child is seen in Stage 01. Saving the child in Stage 01 results in Foxy appearing in Happiest Day. The Spring Bonnie plush kid is Bonnie. This is because the killer, Spring Bonnie, trapped them. They are trapped in a place you can't access initially. Saving the child in the glitch mini game results in Bonnie appearing in Happiest Day. Another reason I believe it's these four kids specifically is because they were supposed to be at the party. Despite two of the kids never mentioning the party, we know that all the children were supposed to attend thanks to what Balloon Kid says. Everyone is going to the party. Yet we never see them there during the bite, unlike the kid who makes fun of the bite victim, who is clearly one of the bullies. A strong piece of evidence that supports this theory is the four plushies in the bite victim's room. Huh. Four plushies that distinctly match visually with the four withered animatronics we see in FNAF 2. Notice the buttons, specifically two like we see on Withered Bonnie and Withered Freddy. Bonnie being more blue in tone, like Withered Bonnie, Foxy's head is missing, and Withered Foxy is noticeably missing a chunk of his head. It's interesting how there are four plushies and four children who were supposed to attend the party but never did. Four friends. 
The four children are murdered by the same killer behind the sister's death, the purple guy. This occurs in between the minigame that they are introduced and the minigame the bite takes place, explaining why they aren't present at the party. They are murdered at the sister location, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, which is where the Wither animatronics are housed, explaining why the phone guy hardly knows anything about Fredbear's, but recalls Foxy so vividly. Uh, I love those old characters. Uh, did you ever see Foxy the Pirate? Oh wait, Foxy. Oh yeah, Foxy. Uh, we're gonna try to contact the original restaurant owner. Uh, I think the name of the place was Fredbear's Family Diner or something like that. A piece of evidence supporting that Freddy's was where the MCI took place is the presence of three clouds in the FNAF 3 minigames, which three clouds can also be seen on stage in FNAF 1. This can also be used to explain the difference in design between the Spring Bonnie and Spring Freddy and the ones we see at Fredbear's. The Spring Bonnie suit the killer uses is the one found at this location specifically. Each of them are given gifts, stuffed into the withered animatronic suits, by the puppet who is inhabited by the sister. The suits are the gifts. My reasoning is the file name for the animatronic parts in FNAF 3 is labeled as GIFT. <laughs> While I know using file names is tricky, we have seen that file names can be reliable. Although the actual explanation is likely due to Scott reusing code from FNAF 2 save the minigame for these cutscenes, seen by the remnants of Puppet Kill in the code. It should be noted that although Scott did remove other elements of the FNAF 2 variant, it's likely this is why the parts are called GIFT. However, I think the animatronic parts being titled GIFT is intentional. There are two reasons I think this. Firstly, Scott uses other objects that are clearly copied but he replaces the sprites with something that matches the title of the object. And second, Scott was easily able to create new objects for new sprites, which makes me think the sprite change was intentional. Because of this detail and the gifts in Give Gifts Give Life being represented as actual gifts, we can assume that the FNAF 2 minigames are more metaphorical rather than literal, explaining why there are five kids present in Foxy Go Go Go, and why the sister's death, who we establish as part of the MCI, is separated from the others. This is because Scott wanted to put more emphasis on who this child was, and which animatronic they were connected to and why the kids are shown killed in the area besides Pirate's Cove. This is because the kids are grouped together to indicate the victim's side of the killer, explaining why this specific purple guy sprite is used here and in Save Him. It's also likely that MCI was shown in Foxy Go 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 as a red herring by Scott in correlation to Phone Guy mentioning how Foxy was his favorite. Like I said, he was always my favorite. They tried to remake Foxy, you know? This would explain why in the news reports in FNAF 1, the missing children, 5 in total, are slowly tied to the event as shown by the article detailing how two are connected to Freddy's at the time of the report. This would also explain Golden Freddy's inconsistent design, as the physical suit, or gift as we put it, was never given to him, so he takes on a reflection of whichever Freddy is present and is specifically golden because of his connection to the plush and Fredbear. It also explains why he appears after the other four since the bite victim died sometime after them outside of Fredbear's in the hospital. The killer is caught and convicted. However, it falls through due to the bodies never being found. This is because the puppet is the one that moved the bodies into the suits, which is why they end up secreting blood and mucus, forcing the place to shut down for sanitation violations at a later point, explaining why nobody thought to look in them, because evidence possibly pointed to the bodies being elsewhere. This explains why in FNAF 2, the bodies of the new victims are thrown around the location instead of stuffed in the suits, because the killer never did stuff the original kids in the suits to begin with. Rather, it was the puppet who did so. As a result of the allegations, the purple guy is let go from his position. The birthday party held for the bite victim at Fredbear's is the day after the four kids were murdered, explaining why the place isn't shut down yet as the children were murdered at the sister location and are only suspected as missing at the time, and why they're not present at the party. This leaves the bite victim open to his brothers and his friends bullying, and ends up causing the death of the child due to Fredbear's bite. <laughs> this tragedy results in the closure of Fredbear's family diner. Mike apologizes to his brother on his deathbed. Before the boy dies, his sister appears to him as the most comforting thing to him, the Fredbear plushie. She tells him that she will put him back together. 
can connect the Fredbear plush to the sister because of the Fredbear plush flower. The normal yellow flower has six petals, while the flower with the Fredbear head obscures the sixth petal, making it five. I believe this establishes a connection with the five petal flower seen in the sister's room, explaining why certain Fredbear plushies don't have pupils before this. The ones with pupil are his sister watching him through the plush, while the ones without pupils before this have no pupils because it's his sister watching him outside of the boy's imagination. A piece of supporting evidence that I need to sell this while also confirming this belief is the way the Fredbear plush is interpreted in FNAF world. The empty eyes of the void are the same as Fredbear's, and both appear in a black void like the eyeless Fredbear plush in the beginning of FNAF 4 appears in void. It's important to note that despite being a different color, it's the context that allows us to make the connections. After this, the bite victim dies, confirmed by the flatline heard as he fades away. The death of his brother ends up creating a nightmare aka Shadow Freddy, as seen in the files of FNAF 4. We can come to the conclusion that Shadow Freddy is connected to the bite victim specifically because in every instance we see Golden Freddy, we see Shadow Freddy. Outside of the first game, of course, this is due to Scott not playing the full story at the time. Nightmare Fredbear, Nightmare. With the Golden Freddy, Shadow Freddy. Therefore, Phantom Freddy is Golden Freddy, because Shadow Freddy is present. But, if you need more proof, in FNAF 3's code, Phantom Freddy is referred to as Golden Freddy. He's also given a specific name, unlike RWQ. After the bite victim's death, the yellow springlock suits are retired and put in the safe room. Freddy Fazbear's pizza continues to remain open before eventually shutting down due to sanitation violations once the animatronics start leaking blood and mucus. 1987. Freddy Fazbear's pizza opens a new and improved location during the summer. Uh, hello and welcome to your new summer job at the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. With new toy animatronics made with parts of the old animatronics from Freddy's, creating a link between them. With that being said, I think I should address what happened exactly to the bodies that were stuffed into the suits. We don't see any hints of bodies in the withered animatronics, which means someone had to have found the remains that would cause blood and mucus to see from the animatronics. If the line about the company retrofitting the animatronics wasn't enough evidence for you. Uh, by now I'm sure you've noticed the older models sitting in the back room. Uh, those are from the previous location, and we just use them for parts now. The idea at first was to repair them. Uh, they even started retrofitting them with some of the newer technology. But they were just so ugly, you know? And the smell. Uh, uh, so the company decided to just go in a whole new direction and make them super kid-friendly. Going off this excellent video here by Underscore, link in the description below as it's a short video at just 2 minutes, I highly recommend watching it as it addresses it much better than I am, uh, Fazbear Entertainment would remove and dispose of the bodies after discovering them due to company policy, never reporting the children as dead and instead missing, inadvertently erasing evidence that could arrest the killer in favor of saving the company's reputation. Okay. Uh, let's see. First, there's an introductory greeting from the company that I'm supposed to read. It's kind of a legal thing, you know. Asbury Entertainment is not responsible for damage to property or person. Upon discovering that damage or death has occurred, a missing person report will be filed within 90 days or as soon as property and premises have been thoroughly cleaned and bleached and the carpets have been replaced. Blah, blah, blah. This explains why the killer would never be fully charged and what happened to the remains of the children. Props are also moved between locations, explaining the carousel. Shadow Freddy resides in parts and service because this is the safe room. Safe rooms are meant for retired equipment, explaining the arcade machines and spring lock suit. But this also explains why the retired wither animatronics reside in parts and service. The safe room is the second obscured room in parts and service. It's open because the safe rooms aren't boarded up just yet. This could also explain why the Withers leave parts and service once they reactivate during the night shift, because their code forbids them to enter the safe room when activated. This could also be why Shadow Freddy ends up leading the animatronics to the safe room in FNAF 3, because he's aware that the purple guy is back because he resides in the safe room. Management attempts to prevent a future tragedy through the inclusion of facial recognition software in the new toy animatronics. Fastberry Entertainment is committed to family fun and above all, safety. They've spent a small fortune on these new animatronics. Uh, facial recognition, advanced mobility. They even let them walk around during the day. <laughs> Isn't that neat? <clears throat> but most importantly, they're all tied into some kind of criminal database so they can detect a predator a mile away. Having a criminal database to spot potential threats. 
The purple guy arrives at the new location and tampers with the facial recognition software in the new animatronics to sneak in, using the vague object he is seen holding. He uses the old spring bonnie suit stored in the safe room and five more children are killed but none are stuffed in the suits, just left around the building. Uh, just as a side note though, uh, try to avoid eye contact with any of the animatronics side of the hand. Uh, someone may have tampered with their facial recognition systems, we're not sure. Uh, keep a close eye on things tonight, okay? Uh, from what I understand, the building is on lockdown, uh, no one is allowed in or out, you know. Especially concerning any previous employees. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back. The yellow one. Someone used it. Now none of them are acting right. Because of this, the collective negative emotions of this tragedy go on to form RWQ, aka Shadow Bonnie. The reason its name is so random is because it's not a soul or a person. It's just a physical manifestation of the tragedy. Also explaining why it takes on the appearance of the toy animatronics. The name, despite being considered a cipher by many, cannot be deciphered using any evidence from the first four games alone, as well as the Silver Eyes and FNAF World. Believe me, I tried, but in doing so it proved that the name holds no meaning as the ciphers thought to solve it would be impossible given how the ciphers work. The new location was also shut down for some time due to an investigation. There's been somewhat of an investigation going on. Uh, we may have had to close for a few days, I don't know. Uh, I want to emphasize though that it's really just a precaution. Uh, Badbury Entertainment denies any wrongdoing. These things happen sometimes. Um, it'll all get sorted out in a few days. Uh, keep a close eye on things tonight, okay? Uh, from what I understand, the building is on lockdown. Uh, no one is allowed in or out, you know, especially concerning any previous employees. Uh, oh, hello! Oh, uh, what on earth are you doing there? Uh, didn't you get the memo? Uh, the place is closed down, at least for a while. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. Now none of them are acting right. And reopened, grand reopening, in November. This is when Jeremy is hired. And before we move any further, let's clear something up right off the bat that you might be thinking. These phone calls are meant for exposition, meaning not all events mentioned take place only during these six nights. We can prove this by how our shift begins in November, but the phone call on the first night mentions it being a summer job. Uh, hello and welcome to your new summer job at the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Along with Phone Guy mentioning how the establishment has closed down already, and yet they're going to be open the next day for one more birthday. Uh, what on earth are you doing there? Uh, didn't you get the memo? Uh, the place is closed down, at least for a while. Uh, we have one more event scheduled for tomorrow, a birthday. You'll be on day shift. The reason the Mangle is allowed to be taken apart and put back together by kids is because the animatronics don't harm the children, having a noticeable reaction to an adult's presence. But the characters have been acting very unusual, almost aggressive towards the staff. They interact with the kids just fine, but when they encounter an adult, they just stare. The extra head and parts on Mangle are just that. Extra parts for Funtime Foxy thrown into the mix, explaining the extra eye present in Kid's Cove. The security guard, Jeremy Fitzgerald, is a victim of the Bite of 87. This is because he was told to stay close to the animatronics, triggering Mangle to lash out at him to protect the children. Uh, we have one more event scheduled for tomorrow, a birthday. You'll be on day shift. Wear your uniform. Stay close to the animatronics and make sure they don't hurt anyone, okay? But the characters have been acting very unusual, almost aggressive towards the staff. They interact with the kids just fine, but when they encounter an adult, they just stare. He survived the attack despite losing his frontal lobe. They used to be allowed to walk around during the day too, but then there was the bite of 87. Yeah, it's amazing that the human body can live without the frontal lobe, you know? It's likely Mingle is the culprit behind the bite due to its jump scare animation, and the odd influence from Golden Freddy. This influence is shown in the hallucinations slash dreams for FNAF 2. In the cutscenes, we see the puppet watches over her brother and keeps peace with the animatronics. The line, it's me, being both from her and her brother. Although the brother's anger influences the animatronics hostility. In contrast, the sister keeps them docile. 
This is shown by her appearance after Golden Freddy where the animatronics calm down from Golden Freddy's presence. There are examples of the new slash withered animatronics being influenced by the spirits of the MCI. Toy Chica is missing her beak. This is because the soul of the girl who had the broken toy was part of the MCI and became Chica. This also explains why Withered Chica has her arms out. The same little girl can be seen with her arms out. Finally, answering the age-old question, in the FNAF 4 minigame, why would the tiny Toy Chica be missing her beak? This hint is also the answer for why 87 is brought up in the FNAF 4 teasers. It wasn't a red herring, nor was it Scott changing his mind about the date. It was a deliberate hint at how to solve FNAF 4. To go back to FNAF 2 and connect the dots seen between the MCI and the sister. Explaining why when the only time Scott gave us hints at where to look, he pointed to a detail that could only be connected to FNAF 2, aka 1987. Balloon Boy is known for his iconic laughter. This is because the boy who became Freddy had a laugh with the same energy. <laughs> with it, Foxy is able to see through the mask. This is because the girl who became Foxy was more aware about the rumors of what went on at Freddy's than the others, aka she's just a little more big brain than the others. With the body missing his left arm. This is because the kid who became Bonnie has her left arm obscured in this right. The theme that keeps the puppet at bay is titled My Grandfather's Clock, perhaps reminding the sister of the clock in her home. The sister also influences Mangle, seen by how the Mangle is taken apart and put back together, similar to how the Mangle toy is presented in the sister's room, along with Mangle being more aware about the purple guy's presence. The new animatronics are scrapped as a result of the bite of 87 and the establishment ends up closing. The safe rooms are issued to be boarded up after FNAF 2. This is due to budgetary circumstances as stated in the newspaper. This is just to inform all employees that due to budget restrictions, previously mentioned safe rooms are being sealed and closed for locations and will be relocated. The Withers are relocated to an appropriate, the original, location to be renovated later. They are slightly renovated with the old parts that were present at the location, explaining why they appear more on the Wither despite being the same animatronics. This also explains the buttons on Freddy and Bonnie, and why Shadow Freddy's sprite matches with Freddy's. They're the same type of animatronic. The purple guy goes to the FNAF 1 location because the spring body suit is moved from the FNAF 2 location with the rest of the Withers to the FNAF 1 location. At the time, the restaurant was closed due to renovations. He goes there to get it once more and destroy the remaining animatronics, shown by how if you just take too long to follow Shadow Freddy, the killer will just spawn in this assembly. We know this is before FNAF 1 thanks to all the trash present. Boarded up bathrooms, leaky roof, rat infestation, and the blood stains that litter the room. The black stains around the location are confirmed to be blood by their names in the files of FNAF 3. If we take into account the old location was left as a rot, this would explain why the safe room is open, and the remnants, not that remnant, of the MCI remain. We can also prove how the purple guy never shot the children in the suits, with blood stains being present all around the building. Similar to how he had placed the bodies around the location and saved them from FNAF 2. And before anyone asks, no, I don't think Fazbear Entertainment left these stains here while they remained open after the MCI, at least not the ones outside of the safe room. I think these stains are there to be looked at from a figurative lens to connect pieces of info together, because if we take the evidence we're given too literal or too figurative, then it doesn't work. While the killer is hiding in the safe room, Shadow Freddy lures the animatronics one by one to the safe room to confront the killer. We can assume this is the case because if Golden Freddy influences hostile behavior in the animatronics, it would make sense if his shadow did the same. A piece of evidence supporting this is Phantom Freddy, who in this context of this theory, would be Golden Freddy, whose mechanic is walking across what the hallway. That? <laughs> this all happens on the same night. We can assume this because it's continuously raining and each animatronics part still remain. If we take into account what we established before of Golden Freddy never possessing a real suit, it makes sense why the final child shows up immediately. This child confronts the purple guy for killing his friends. The killer is scared and runs from the child before attempting to scare him with the springlock suit. However, in this moment of fear, he forgot about the state of the building in costume, falling victim to a springlock failure.
bleeding out as the spirits are content for the time being. They cannot move on as the four children are still tied to their suits and the crying child still seeks vengeance for his death. The bite victim leaves hints for Mike to find in the left hall. This is in the same hall where Golden Freddy can be triggered. Figured I'd state this, but this is due to the sisters' influence in FNAF world. However, this does not determine when FNAF World takes place, as its place in the timeline is irrelevant, concerning most of its content has little to do with actual lore. Much like the phone calls in FNAF 2, I don't think FNAF World has a set date. I think it's mainly just there for Ooh. exposition and extra context. I just want to make clear though that we can make the connection with these clues and the bite victim outside of FNAF World. I just add this extra context as it makes it more clear to understand why the bite victim would leave these clues for Mike to find despite wanting retribution for his death. Fazbear Entertainment finds the dismantled animatronics and is forced to completely overhaul them, explaining the difference in design from FNAF 2 to FNAF 1. They also board up the safe room with the purple guy inside because by the time they find him, his bloodstains don't stand out from the ones left by the MCI. Not paying much attention, or instead most likely not wanting the brand to get into any more controversy, Fazbear Entertainment boards it up, getting ready to try one last time with Freddy's. 1993 Mike gets a job at Freddy's, seemingly forgetting and repressing his trauma of his older experiences with the franchise. We know the year is 1993 thanks to the paycheck, which is the amount of minimum wage an employee would usually be paid in 1993. Although a supporting piece of evidence not needed to solve this but confirms this belief is found in the Silver Eyes novel. It states that the events happened 10 years after the tragedy of the MCI in the book, which lines up perfectly in this context. Because Mike has a connection to the children, being the sibling of the bite victim, the children try to remind Mike of who they are through the phrase, It's me, appearing on the out of order sign, flashing with hallucination oh shown to Mike, God. and shown on the wall where posters of the crying child can be seen. The image of Freddy ripping his head off is meant to hint the Mike as to what to do. Mike is fully reminded only when the yellow bear appears, the animatronic that caused the death of his brother. Mike ends up following the clues his brother and sister had left for him and attempts to put them to rest. Unfortunately, before he can make any real progress, he is fired for tampering with the animatronics and his odor. That odor is a result of digging into the suits, as we know the animatronics have a stinky, stinky, fumey, mewy. Uh, the animatronic characters here do get a bit quirky at night, but do I blame them? No. If I were forced to sing those same stupid songs for 20 years and I never got a bath, I'd probably be a bit irritable at night too. After being fired from Freddy's, I believe this is when FNAF 4 takes place. The line connected to the box in FNAF 4, perhaps some things are best left forgotten for now, are seen in a similar grey color as the older brother's lines, despite being white in the files. The file the text resides in was given a semi-transparent effect in the files. This is because the text was an image rather than a string of text explaining the slightly different grey color. Because of this effect, this line is intended to be seen in grey rather than white. Therefore, it isn't necessarily that the text being the same color that's important and connects it, but rather the context of the lines and its similar intent. FNAF 4's marketing is also a supporting piece of evidence. The nightmares are asking a question as if somebody had forgotten. Was it me? Or was it me? I believe this could explain the night sections of FNAF 4 are the nightmares of Mike after FNAF 1, explaining why FNAF 4 takes elements from FNAF 1 and twisting them while also being clearly a dream slash nightmare. The phone, the desk fan, the reverse phone guy call. <laughs> Even Chica rustling in the chicken. Hey, this is future Joe. Just wanna let you know I meant KITCHEN! There's this odd easter egg in the game where you're able to summon Nightmare Foxy on every night just by looking at the bed for 15 seconds without looking anywhere else. He'll also be forced spawned after looking at the bed for 15 seconds without running somewhere. Since Scott said he didn't add a bunch of random easter eggs and this seems deliberately intended, I believe this is a parallel to Foxy's mechanic from FNAF 1. AK not paying attention results in him coming. Ah, she got me. <laughs> what the f- Notice how the nightmares look more like the withers in shape compared to the classics. Bonnie's whiskers, Chica's beak, Freddy mimicking his pose from the FNAF 2 teaser, and Foxy's single tufts of fur. But if Mike is meant to be having nightmares because of FNAF 1, then why don't they look more like the classics? 
They take on the FNAF 2 designs because Mike has seen the MC9 kids and his brother as animatronics, explaining why they resemble the FNAF 2 withers because those are the original suits they were stuffed in. And Nightmare Fredbear has a stomach mouth because he bit hey, his brother. So it can be explained that FNAF 1 simply brought back his traumatic childhood and that is manifesting in his dreams. The classics, while indeed murderous and are definitely scaring Mike in a sense, are still nowhere near compared to the era of FNAF where he accidentally killed his brother. So that's what he associates most with his nightmares. Trauma. The idea that the nightmares bring up Mike's trauma could also explain the vague hospital hints appearing, as if someone is remembering visiting the hospital. We also know that the older brother did visit the bi victim in the hospital, apologizing to him in the process. This would also explain why in Nightmare's jump scare, you can hear the slightest hint of an ambulance sirens. Take a listen here. The reason the grandfather clock is present in the first three FNAF games is because it could possibly be Golden Freddy causing the guards to hear it as a reminder of his past. But the alarm clock is present in FNAF 4 because Mike isn't working at Freddy's anymore due to being fired, and also because he's waking up from a nightmare. This implies that despite Golden Freddy appearing, the idea that he influences the other animatronics and that explains why they become hostile supports the idea that chimes come as a reminder of his past thanks to his presence being felt even if it doesn't appear like he's there at first. I believe this answers why the chimes appear in FNAF 2 when Mike is nowhere to be seen, although there is a connection with Fritz Smith so I'll present two possibilities here. Custom Night is not canon. My reason being that Shadow Freddy is specifically not able to be summoned on this night. This would also explain why someone is hired to work after Jeremy even though the restaurant closed. Although it is important to keep in mind that FNAF 2 was rushed, and Shadow Freddy not being in custom night could be an oversight by Scott considering the main mechanic behind the character was also bugged. To learn more about that, check out this excellent video by It's Taken, link in the description. The second is that Fritz Smith is the killer under a new alias. Now, while this is supported by how William becomes Dave in the books, there is evidence in the games to confirm this parallel. The two separate purple guy sprites could show how the killer's appearance changed over time, the company not recognizing him as a result. Therefore, the badge on the killer symbolizes how he becomes a guard at that location, as the other sprite does not have a badge despite us knowing he had access to things that only an employee slash higher up would. And while Mike does get fired for very similar reasons, I believe this is another red herring, as Mike is also fired with time and the added unprofessionalism, while Fritz isn't, literally being fired on his first day. Here, the odor and tampering are under a different context. The killer dismantles the animatronics, something he carries out when going to Freddy's in FNAF 3, possibly explaining the box of FNAF 2 parts being in similar condition to the dismantled animatronic parts. And the odor is due to bro's poor hygiene? <laughs> Ultimately, Mike decides that his trauma should stay forgotten, at least for now, having to wait until 30 years later when FNAF 3 takes place to tackle his trauma once more. 2023. Mike decides to work at Fazbear Frights due to finding out real parts from the original locations are present, deciding now is the time to finally confront his past trauma and put his brother and their friends to rest after it's brought up again. But if we don't have the logbook to confirm Mike is the guard in FNAF 3, how do we know it's Mike? The answer to this is the phone dude calls. It confirms Mike had worked an extra night previously, showing interest in remaining despite no real interest being apparent by phone dude's remark of Hey hey, glad you came back for another night. I promise it'll be a lot more interesting this time. The reason nothing happens on the first night reinforces this theory as well. You're forced to stay while nothing seemingly interesting happens. You can only do one thing and that's interact with the BB drawing to begin the path for the good ending, pointing towards Mike's reasoning for remaining at Fazbear's Frights. We can also prove the guard is Mike due to the line in the newspaper stating, this new attraction is guaranteed to bring back your childhood in the worst possible way. When we look at this with the context of this theory, it establishes a tie between the night guard and Mike, as well as a whole new meaning on a seemingly innocent comment. The phone dude calls also support the idea that the safe room was boarded up out of FNAF 2. The phone dude says on night one of FNAF 3, we found some great new relics over the weekend. We found some, some great new relics over the weekend, and we're out tracking down a new lead 
right now. These relics are the FNAF 1 animatronics. That's why we never see them fully put together in FNAF 3. Uh, now let me tell you about what's new. We found another set of drawings, always nice, and a foxy head, which we think could be authentic. Then again, it might just be another crappy cosplay. It literally says in the same call that they found the foxy head, so we know for a fact that it's FNAF 1's location that they're getting these from. The people running Fazbear's Frights had no idea the safe room even existed, and no way does he mention the safe room at all on night 1. On night 1, the phone dude also says that they're trying to track down a good lead right now, which could very well be the CEO or someone high on the food chain at Fazbear Entertainment, between nights 1 and 2. We found some, some great new relics over the weekend, and we're out tracking down a new lead right now. They get in contact with said individual, and they tell them about the safe room. We're trying to track down a good lead right now. Uh, some guy who helped design one of the buildings says it was like an extra room that got boarded up or something like that. So we're gonna- Whether or not they know about the killer being in there is not relevant. That's why it isn't until night two Springtrap is mentioned and present in the attraction. But I have an even better surprise for you. And you're not gonna believe this. We found one. A real one. When Springtrap arrives at the location, Mike is forced to relive his trauma head on in the form of the Phantom slash minigames. Isn't it odd that Phantom Chica appears in the arcade cabinet, and that the Shadow Cupcakes leads to the Chica minigame? And we know that the Phantoms are in the mind of the Night Guard based on the teaser for the game. I think the Phantoms represent trauma. Phantom Foxy represents Mike's trauma. Phantom Freddy represents Bite Victim's trauma. Phantom Mangle and Phantom Puppet both represent the sister's trauma. The large puppet in Mangle's quest, taken with the context of FNAF 4 sister's room having a broken Mangle toy, implies that the sister goes on to become the puppet. Notice how Phantom Puppet and Mangle both watch you instead of jump scaring you, just staring at you as if they're looking at someone they recognize. Phantom BB represents the loss of innocence with the three siblings. The three BBs in the tree represent three siblings connected by a family tree. Mike the bite victim, and the puppet. Each of them are seen crying due to the trauma they have experienced. Phantom Chica represents the trauma of the four missing children and the bite victim. The five cupcakes in Chica's party represent the four missing kids and the bite victim who is following Mike. We know this is a reference to them due to the golden and pink cupcake drawing easter egg. The drawings are connected to the phantoms due to using them to access minigames and the appearance of Spring Bonnie who supports the same design scene in stage 01. Mike is also forced to confront the murder of his sister and all the other children, who lives on in agony. Again, not that agony. We can assume the killer is in agony during FNAF 3 because of the rare screens, which show Springtrap attempting to escape his suit. It was also theorized that a certain audio in FNAF 3 is actually Springtrap moaning in pain for help. Though fun fact, this is actually just alpaca noises used by Scott slowed down. In this context, the idea that Springtrap lives on while the others finally rest makes more sense. He is forced to suffer trapped in the suit he used to make others suffer greatly. A fire breaks out due to faulty wiring, burning down Fazbear's frights. So, uh, let me just update you real quick, then you can get to work. Like, the attraction opens in like a week, so we have to make sure everything works and nothing catches on fire. <laughs> so in trying to make the place feel vintage, we may have overdone it a bit. <laughs> Some of this equipment is barely functional. Yeah, I wasn't joking about the fire. That's, that's, that's a real risk. The heat purges all the suffering from the building, while the fire heals the character of Mike as he sets all the children free. I believe Mike lives on in a bittersweet moment, as the name of the song during the good ending is titled Don't Go. This is also most likely the case, as no death is reported alongside the fire. Mike is finally free of his trauma, and is able to move on, signifying the end of Five Nights at Freddy's. Four games, one story. At least the original story before the wreck on. In conclusion, I would like to wrap up this video by explaining some small questions that might arise from this theory. To explain, Ender 2 JJ, the mic sprite, the pictures of Scott's family in FNAF 4, who the phone guy is, what the Springlock failures phone guy refers to are, and Plus Trap are not important. This is because they're more simple than they appear and don't offer or take away much from the overall story, but just for fun, I'll try to explain them anyways. I believe the Endo 2 easter egg was included simply for the sake of showing off the endoskeleton model Scott made, because if you think about it, Scott showed off Endo 01 in FNAF 1, being present even in the game's marketing. 
I theorized one of the reasons Nightmare is see-through was so Scott could show off the Nightmare on the skeleton he made. And he would eventually show off the plush trap Endo in FNAF World due to the quote-unquote character quota. I think Bro just really likes his robots. Like, seriously. JJ is a simple easter egg. It is possible they could be symbolism for the twins, although I decided to leave that up for interpretation at this moment. I know there's a lot of interest and mystery behind this mic sprite, so let me explain it real quick. This sprite is used for a marker, seemingly tied to the character Mike. You can tell it's just a sprite for the marker thanks to its size being identical to the others. However, unlike the other markers present, this one does not have an AI counter of its own, meaning it doesn't appear and affects nothing in the final game. With this context, we can assume it's just a drop feature like the toxic meter and puppet in the office. After all, Scott doesn't seem to remove anything on use in his games. I believe the inclusion of images of Scott's family being used in FNAF 4 was to fill out the images around the house, aka set dressing, and not an intentional easter egg on Scott's part. It's like Scott being canon in the series before it was popularized and helped want it. People just took it too literally, and overthink something that's not meant to be taken seriously compared to everything else. We do actually know somewhat who the phone guy is. He's clearly just a lifelong employee of the company, most likely part of management for Fazbear Entertainment. Management has also been made aware that the Spring Bonnie animatronic Hi. has been noticeably moved. We would like to remind employees that this costume is not safe to wear under any circumstances. Management also requests that this room not be mentioned to family, friends, or insurance Hello. representatives. Thanks again. Remember to smile. You are the face of Freddy Fazbear's team. Uh, the first guy finished his week but complained about conditions. Uh, we switched him over to the day shift. So while our engineers don't really have an explanation for this, the staff literally had to put Foxy back together in this every shift. I think the employees refer to him as just the mangle. That whatever is going on out there, however tragic it may be, has nothing to do with our establishment. He can't be Fritz because Fritz is fired on the first day, which would contrast Phone Guy being a part of management in FNAF 1. Okay, uh, let's see. First, there's an introductory greeting from the company that I'm supposed to read. And it's kind of a legal thing, you know. Um, welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The Springtrap failures mentioned in FNAF 3 are meant to foreshadow the Purple Guy's death, explaining what's going on with our Springtrap friend here and why it's mentioned the night before we see who resides in Springtrap. Right now, we have two specially designed suits that double as both animatronic and suit. So please pay close attention while learning how to operate these suits as accidents, slash injury, slash death, slash irreparable and grotesque maiming can occur. Uh, there's been a slight change of company policy concerning use of the suit. Hello? Um, don't. Management has also been made aware that the Spring Bonnie animatronic Hi. has been noticeably moved. I'd like to remind employees that this costume is not safe to wear under any circumstances. I know some people like to connect this to the Fredbear bite, which I can see, until you realize that the animatronics are in, well, animatronic mode. Meaning their screen locks can't come loose if they aren't wound in the first place. And Plush Trap was created for the minigame. Nothing more, nothing less. That leaves one thing, of course. The biggest mystery left forgotten. What was in the box? To be completely honest, I don't think I could know or answer whatever was intended to be inside it 100% correctly, although with the context of this theory, I can provide a possible answer. The box isn't real. How do I know this? Well, look at the scene here. I feel so many people are focused on the box and what's inside it that we forget to look at the rest of the image. A black background with a gray shadow circle underneath it. Where have we seen this before? Well, look at the ending of the game. A black background with a gray shadow circle. A scene we know isn't real. So if the box isn't real, then what does it represent? The answer? Mike's trauma and memories. The pieces put together. This is why when the box is open in FNAF World, we see seemingly nothing inside. Because the box is a metaphor for Mike's character. When he finally overcomes his trauma and sets his brother, sister, and the other children free, Mike moves on while the other children rest. The memories and trauma of the past fading away symbolized by how the box opens and whatever was there is now gone. This explains why the trophy for the clock in the FNAF world is the crying child no longer crying. But it isn't just FNAF world that supports this belief. The silver eyes alone confirm the idea of the main protagonist suppressing their memories and trauma inside of themselves. Just take a look at these few examples here. Granted, there are plenty more, but that will be covered in part 2. 
This interpretation explains why Scott didn't think the community would accept it because what was inside was a metaphor and not a direct answer. I think Scott put it best here. Some things are best left forgotten forever. Have on whole wheat. All right. <laughs> Hey there, I'd like to thank you for watching through to this point. This last section is mostly for special thanks, so if you want to take your leave, feel free. I do appreciate it if you did take the time to watch through this long video, and hopefully this theory made an impact in some way for how we look at FNAF. I had quite a bit of fun crafting this theory and just wanted to share my thoughts with all of you. FNAF is something that's special to me like I'm sure it is to most of you. Regardless on if you agree with my theory or not, I encourage you to comment below what you think the original story was, and if there was any issues with this theory. I apologize again that part 2 isn't ready. These videos take time and to double check and ensure it makes sense. I, I don't think I'm going to be doing any more theory videos after part 2 comes out though. I mean, maybe if there's something I may have missed with this theory, I'd do another. Although, if you are looking for more theories, I recommend checking out my friend Zipperbomb's channel. I also want to give a big thanks to my good friend Zipperbomb, actually, for always being there to listen and offer his thoughts on this theory. We spent so many nights just staying up late thinking about FNAF that I feel tired just thinking about it. He also made the amazing thumbnail renders for both parts, not to mention he is also publishing part 2 on his channel, so you might want to hit the notification bell for that. I'd also like to thank some of my good friendos, Eva, Alipai, Familiar Fan, Sapphire, Revy, Goji, Blitzodome, Gibbs, Bomnom, Mactus, Madzilla, Dylan Zamuffin, Sega, Sora, Stankfeld, Raising Crow, and Uni for having to deal with me discussing and sending them the theory to review and listen to. Their feedback was very crucial for me to make sure I wasn't given into any confirmation bias and that everything did make sense, bringing up suggestions and curveballs that would end up strengthening this theory even more than I could do alone. Next up, I'd like to thank a couple of theorists that inspired me to make this theory in the first place. Sire Squawks, for motivating me to really aim to hit every nail on the head when offering a theory that could simultaneously solve FNAF and disprove Dream Theory. Internet Inferno, for attempting to solve the box, and as a result, inspiring and influencing the theory that this video would craft. Silent End Productions, for introducing me to the headcanon of FNAF 4 MCI, as well as looking at theories from every possible angle. Seriously, every possible angle. FNAF. For offering theories that look at everything from an alternate point of view. And while I think some tend to reach a bit and are hard to follow at times, others are really convincing and help me to think outside the box. MatPat. The more me and Zipper spend time theorizing and coming to conclusions, the more our respect grew for you. Solving FNAF made me understand and respect you and your theories so much more than I had before, and honestly led to some good laughs about some shared experiences. While I do disagree with some of the theories you presented before, I have to hand it to you when I say that most of the discoveries would not be made or be as known because of your teams and the community's efforts. If it weren't for your determination to make sense of FNAF, I don't think Scott would have given us the clues necessary to solve this story. Lastly, Scott Cawthon. Thank you, Scott. I hope that whatever you're doing next, you're satisfied with the new direction you're taking the story. Me and my friends look forward to trying to solve the next chapter of FNAF. This theory gives me hope that you respect the story and that the pieces are there. We just have to find them. 